have a, a little post-Thanksgiving um, um, Okay, little post Thanksgiving vacation from Formans uh, today, and we're going to take it up again Tuesday. Uh, because of the gal who was here in voice therapy and vocal abuse Tuesday, I thought it would be good to have all week on uh, the more practical aspects of, uh, you just go right in, Roberta. They'll take a picture of you, but that's all right. Um, the more practical aspects of vocal pedagogy, and I hope we can do some more of that at the end of the semester. Since you were so swift last week on formants, who knows? Next week, you may get it in just two more sessions, and then we'll be able to do something else. Uh, <clears throat> this that I have on the board now uh, seems self-evident to anybody who's, who's a singer. You, uh, I hope, do all of those things automatically, but your students may not. Um, the first one, the easy mouth position, depends upon what kind of mouth you have and what shape it is and all that. We've been through that before, but I think that someone who comes in and starts to sing and looks like this, either you haven't taught them how their mouths should be relaxed, or they just had a fight, an important fight with an important person that morning. So you should do something about that. There are a lot of things you can do, and we will be talking about that later on in the hour, um, because I think one of the things we need to talk about from the point of view of practical application of what's commonly called corrective techniques is that there are two things that I think are most general areas that are most commonly encountered with um, students of singing. One area is the breathing either not enough breath energy or more commonly too much so that you have a spurting airstream, an unsteady airstream, or one that's under very high air pressure and uh, causing problems right here under the larynx. So um, there's the breathing area. And the other one that's the most common is the tight jaw depressed tongue, tight mouth, all of, the, all of the things right up in here. They often go together. So easy mouth position. Then the second one uh, listed is open throat. We've talked about open throat. Everybody agrees that you should have an open throat. How you get it is, is, another, is another matter. Um, a relaxed jaw. It doesn't mean you have to stand there looking like a moron. You know, a relaxed jaw can be a relaxed jaw when you're not that open. Uh, good breath and posture. Um, did I ever tell you about that uh, student I had when I first started teaching at this university who, uh, who stood like a stork? You know, I was... I wasn't young, but I hadn't taught all that long, and this was down in the basement of Mackey where they always put all the, you know, the, the hopefuls. And it wasn't a very um, engaging atmosphere or exhilarating atmosphere, but she just, you know, she, we had this little window up toward the top, and she would, she would walk over toward the window as I'd play da-da-da-da-da or some dumb vocalese. She'd walk, walk over toward the window, and then she'd go, I never could do it for very long, but she'd just do it for minutes and on. I didn't. She'd, she'd look out that window and sing, and I thought, what is she doing? You're not supposed to do that when you take singing. You're supposed to stand by the piano and look attentively at the teacher <laughs> and have marvelous posture and all of these kinds of things. And she wasn't doing any of that. And I was about ready to exert my authority, you know. I was about ready to say, hey, what do you think you're doing over there? You can't sing on one leg, and so on and so on, when I realized that the sound was just beautiful. 
she, it wasn't due to me, she was kind of one of those natural singers. You know, I hadn't had that much experience. I wasn't that good a teacher. And, uh, but I listened to the sound. There wasn't a thing wrong with the sound. Every now and then she'd put that leg down and put the other one up, you know, and do the same thing. And when she wasn't doing that, she was walking around the studio. So I learned then that there are people who do things a lot of different ways. And I also learned that movement all, a lot of times is much better than having somebody standing there, which, which you all have found out. I'm sure whenever you started doing stage work and you wondered why your voice sounded so much better. Well, part of the reason was you're moving around, and part of the other reason is you're not yourself, you're playing another character, so you lose some of your personal self-consciousness. So when you say good breath and good posture, don't, don't believe in the tin, tin soldier thing all the time. And then one that's not too often considered in this is that the person who's going to sing has to have a mental concept First of all, of what frequency they're going to sing, what pitch are you going to sing, what vowel you're going to sing. You've got to sing on a sound. Sound is made on vowels. Sound is not made on consonants. So on the what vowel are you going to sing, and at what dynamic level. Now you see, maybe, maybe all you advanced students do that automatically. <laughs> but. I think that some of the problems when things don't work too well is you haven't thought about some of those things. Say you have, have um, um, a word that's, uh, say you have a song that has the word cow in it. <laughs> it's not too likely that you'd start out a song with cow, is it? You might start out a song with house. The house. What if you what if you look at that? It's spelled O U. Okay, so visually you immediately say that's an O. How do you make an O? So you're going the ho house. Besides the diphthong, instead of singing an A, ah, you might very well sing the house. You got the A ah and the U uh all mixed up with each other, so you're not singing one vowel before the other one. Do you understand what I'm talking about? When you're, t when you're teaching your students and you're teaching them about vowels and, and diction and all these things that you teach them. Um, did you ever think maybe they're confused about that? about what it is they're supposed to be seeing when they have a word that's H-O-U-S-E or any other diphthong, M-I-N-E. Mm -hmm. How many times have you heard people sing, mine? Diphthongs are wonderful things to make that country western sound, you know, right? Well, there's a reason for that. They just don't, if all of a sudden they're singing fine, all, and, and then they come to this funny little sound in there. There has to be a reason why they're doing that. Okay. Mm, number six, we won't talk a lot about. But I think it needs to be there, right? I still confused with number five, what you were getting at. Oh, what I was hinting at? I thought I was saying something pretty plainly. Lisa. <laughs> Getting at that students can be confused. They have to think the right vowel. Well, they have to think, think some vowel. They can't think an indiscriminate sound is what I'm saying. Okay. okay? They can't have foggy, foggy concepts of what it is they're going to do the next second. In addition to that, have you ever thought about the number of things you have to think about and do before you start making a singing sound. Have you ever thought about that? Well, what? Besides not having a foggy concept about the vowel, what else do you have to do, do you think? Everything I will <laughs> <laughs> Preparation for emission of a tone? Yeah. Well, that's right. And just the whole business of taking a breath at the right place. If you take a breath too early, you're standing there like a stuffed toad with all that air, and you, haven't, you're not, you don't get to let any of it out. If you take it too late, you're going <gasps> So you have to take it just at the right time. There are a lot of these things that, after you learn to sing, you never think about anymore. 
But when you teach, you have to think about, or you should think about, with your students. Okay, uh, since two of the things, number one and number three, are concerned with the jaw and mouth and tension and so on, let's just, let's just get some ideas about how you deal with that. Uh, and we'll <coughs> appropriately label it mouth and jaw tension. And then <laughs> you will tell me all your good ideas for how you cope with that problem. Now, I think it would be a good idea to start with the jaw. Somebody has a stiff jaw. Mm -hmm. yeah. OK, what do you do? You can have them massage, perhaps. Like yeah. Molars or I call it, yeah, you call it that, too. I guess maybe there are a lot of people that call it that. Between the molars massage, if you read a book on on voice therapy, you almost always come across this pretty early on. Is this kind of, now it, it takes her, you know, you can do this kind of massage before the person sings. You can do this while the person, ah, you know, while they're doing it. It's not going to disturb the sound. And a, a, a low vigorous Massage in the right place. Now, you can't massage in here because that changes the embouchure, see? <laughs> I'm pretty sure they're going, oh, yeah, they're not doing too well. OK? Now, along with this, to release, and I'm saying this, um, to release it because it, uh, it relates to what um, Mary Lou was talking about the pla or blah vocalies. Blah, 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 does the same thing as massaging there. You see, what you're doing is releasing these cheek muscles. Now, if you have somebody who you do, you, you think, oh, this is a neat vocalies. I'm going to have the kids do this kid. Do. I've done it in voice class, you know, when a lot of them are singing like this. And they'll sing, they go, blah, 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 you know? So I think that you have to insist plop, 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 that, that this moves, mm -hmm. that the, which means you might not get such a good sound. Plop, plop, plop. <laughs> it wiggles a little bit when, when, you, uh, when you make that, when it does this. But it's essential that this get loose before you can get, get a good sound. OK? Any other good ideas? like? Uh, when you blow through your lips, is that the, you know, the boom? What, what, what uh, show me like what a, you mean. Boom, boom. Oh, you mean is the, that the, the lip buzz. Is that the jaw? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's really such a lot of fun anyway. <laughs> How many people can do that? Because there are some people who can't do that, you know. They go. <laughs> <laughs> well, that was just two. Two people in the front row, if the whole class did that, including you, John, just think the amount of noise we would have. They would think a helicopter had landed. But uh, some people can't do it, you know. Some people can't do that. Why? Do you think it's because of the tension, tension. in the mouth? Mm -hmm. So wouldn't that help to encourage uh, relaxation? If yeah, if they can do it. Really? If they can do it. If they can't do it, there's no point in making them try to do it. Because you know what they'll do? They'll go home, and over the dishes, they'll go. <laughs> you know, pretty soon all this will be just as tight as can be. But you can learn to do it. Well, I, I think you can, too. I'm not sure you can learn to do it. In other words, I'm not one who believes that people learn um, that good teaching is done by emphasizing and working on the weaknesses. I believe good teaching is done by working on the strengths and sneaking up on the weaknesses. It's just that simple, particularly in what we're teaching, when people are so emotionally involved in what they're doing. If you continually emphasize what they can't do, you get them just that much more tense, really tied in knots, I think. Of course, I, I believe in a positive approach to learning anyway. I don't think you should ever dump on people. I don't care how 
uh, untutored they are. Some people call it dumb. <laughs> you know, I mean, if people haven't gotten certain, and my husband teaches fifth grade, you know, and has for 28 years. And he believes that every child, no matter what their background and what their achievement in school up to that point, if they start learning something, then they take a much more positive approach toward any future learning. I think that that's emphasized in the teaching of singing when the instrument's in the body, you know. Um, so if somebody can't go, almost couldn't do it, that, that, uh, that means their lips muscles are very tight. And if their lip muscles are very tight, in every likelihood, their tongue is very tight also. Hmm? I, I used to have a teacher that would make me sing with my tongue from the outside of my mouth. Yeah. Because I would have to hold on to You didn't have to hold on to your tongue, huh? No. Just had to stick it out there. Out. You're lucky. Yeah. There are lots of people that want you to take a piece of cheesecloth and grab the end of your <laughs> tongue and hold it out here. Which means that it's protesting the whole way, you know, going, no, I don't want to be out there. <laughs> and trying to pull back, you know. Now, at least that was a self-extension. Maybe that's why you have no tongue problems. When, how old were you when this happened? Did you feel that there was a reason why he or she asked you to stick your tongue out there? Did they say? Because I had a tight tongue. I huh. had to hold back on my tongue. Cool. So she would just say, stick it out on your lip and uh, act retarded. <laughs> that's bad, that's bad. <laughs> well, that's, that's a pretty darn good idea. Because I feel people that are tight here, there's such a thing as what I call, and I guess it's kind of discriminatory and I could get sued for it, the moron look. You know? <laughs> and that's what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. no. Only she added the tongue. Maybe that's a good idea. And that, that goes along with, with what we've got on here now, because that, that's trying to get this loose and the hinge of the jaw loose. Now, if those things aren't loose, you can do all the lift you want to and all the other stuff. It, it's too early. It's too early to do that unless this is loose. Uh, so we'll put down here. <laughs> We're on look, tongue out. That's an optional, that's an optional part of it, yeah? I saw an exercise this summer in Denver where the approach was to grab your hands yeah. and shake them in front. Did you say, uh huh? Oh, yeah. That's a and great one. Not even thinking about your jaw, but it's yeah. 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 Really? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I do that in natural classes. It's very, very good. Oh, really yeah. Very uh, very good. Really uh, yeah. Uh, let's see. Yeah. Oh, it's a scale. Yeah, you do. Yeah, you can. You do so? I never do that. What do you do again? You just gotta let your mouth kind of hang out. Like that? It should shake. It should shake. 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 Maybe I'm not vigorous enough. Yeah, it does shake, doesn't it? <laughs> That's a good idea because people a lot of times don't know they're not shaking. If you do that very vigorously and it still doesn't shake, obviously you've got a problem. Uh huh. Well, that's good. Now, one I like a lot is the raspberry. Oh. Can you do that? Very good, John. Does anyone here can't do that? I can't. I've had a hard time. I have trouble with it. Let's 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 see you, Emily. <laughs> see, she's got she's got a, a little too heavy air pressure going through there. Um, could you uh, could you open your mouth like you're pretending you're going through the moron thing, <laughs> and then go just. That's right, send it in the air. Now don't give up. <laughs> Never give up. That was me every week. Because you're being asked to do that? Mm -hmm. Oh well, 
Um, Roberta? <laughs> I don't know if this is the same thing that uh, Robin said, but my teacher makes me, um, she goes, yeah, we use scales on mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Is that the same thing or is that? Mm -hmm. That's the raspberry. That's the raspberry. It's very good for uh, for anyone who has a, a lot of times you're singing and, and you're pressing down the back of your tongue and you don't know you're doing it. So you go, oh, hear that? Oh, you just have to press a little bit and, and the tongue gets slightly muffled. So what I, what my students do is so they do a, a scale right after it. But I suppose in real remedial <laughs> cases like you two, you could go <laughs> the, only problem, the only problem with um, raspberries is that people feel awfully silly doing that's one thing. And another thing is they must stand back from the piano. <laughs> if you have anything important on the piano, it's going to get sprayed. But it is real good, good for throwing. And Emily, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give up. I would try that it works more on. A while. I would try that more on approach because what is causing you to not do it now, I think, is you've got it under too high an air pressure. Don't you think? Like if someone goes. <laughs> you know, I mean, no wonder they can't do it. It's under so much air pressure. And it's a perfect proof that there is such a thing as too much air pressure. For anyone who, who tells you there is no such thing as too much support. Now, I'll tell you who can't do it in spades is Cuneo. She goes, <laughs> and that's where I got this idea. Well, of course, the tongue is very tight. It's a Japanese language, you know. It's a very retracted tongue and a very tight tongue. And if you ever hear any Oriental people speak, they speak with a lot of uh, ba, 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 this, this kind of, of, of spurted sound. You know what I mean? In contrast to Italians and Spaniards, you just think that they're never going to stop. 